good morning and good afternoon, everyone. We'll go ahead and uh, let the Zoom room fill up for a second here. So we'll just be quiet in the background for a couple seconds here. All right, it seems like we're leveling off here, but we'll go ahead and uh, get started. So thank you everybody for attending today's meeting. Um, you know, as an association, um, one, of the, uh, one of the core tenets is, is of advocacy. Um, one thing that we've noticed within our industry is that most uh, uh, representatives don't understand what is a private lender, um, what are private lenders, um, in, you know, what do they do? How, do they, how are they differentiated from a bank, for example? Um, and so because of that and, and, the, and how we are an unknown commodity from a legislative perspective, what happens is, is we are constantly worried about what are the unintended consequence, which will directly affect our industry. And this is the classic example of it. So uh, glad you're here today. We've got an action plan put together and we'll kind of explain how, you know, how we got here, what we intend on doing. But as an association, this is what we were built for um, and what we're very good at, uh, particularly with mobilizing efforts to really counteract and provide informational campaigns to really get the message out that there is a significant unintended consequence that will have a huge impact on our industry that people probably didn't anticipate. So first, is let's get an understanding uh, for those who have been reading the emails and social posts or otherwise, um, what is this thing high level? So um, as many of you have probably heard, there is a one and a half trillion dollar um, bipartisan infrastructure bill. And then there is separately a three and a half trillion dollar um, bill that is non, not partisan, or sorry, that is partisan, that is democratically supported only. And so because there will be no senators in, um, in the Senate that, or no Republican senators that will vote on it, that means they have exactly 50 senators uh, available. And normally you could filibuster that sort of proposal. The one way around the filibuster is this process called reconciliation. And so because there is no Republican support, they are using reconciliation as a methodology. One of the components of reconciliation is that if you're going to increase spending, you have to offset it with revenue increases, right? Increase taxes effectively is how you have to get here. So um, that is why this bill exists and why there is tax revenue. So most of this bill, most of, of this reconcili reconciliation bill is really tax related. So increases of marginal tax rates, capital gains, all those sorts of things. Um, and then there is a whole other section dealing with what IRA investors can invest in, as well as significant restrictions on IRA. And that's really what's problematic from an association perspective, and we will drill down on heavily. So uh, before we do that, um, I do want to make sure that we give a special thank you. Uh, Court's on the line with us today um, with Nexus Capital. So um, you know these sorts of issues, we talk about it con consistently at American Association of Private Lenders, that um, we are only as good as our membership base, and particularly when people provide these sorts of leads. Uh, candidly, this was not on our law firm's radar, and it wasn't on the association's general radar about this bill. What had happened in this particular situation is we had people such as Anne-Marie uh, and Quest who were saying, hey, like, there's a bunch of really significant provisions within this tax bill that are going to affect um, private investment. And then we're starting to layer it and going, oh my gosh, like this is, this is huge, right? This is one of those things that we have to mobilize on. But we weren't organically learning about this thing. It was people in the membership base that were really getting it to us. And then, um, you know, once Court became aware of the issue, um, he spent an entire weekend reading every single piece of data about this thing, putting together a policy position related to and making it relevant, right? Because ultimately is um, this is you know, uh, primarily a Regulation D issue, but you've got to take a few attenuated steps to explain to someone what is Reg D and why do they care, right? You're, you've got a short window here. And so we've got to figure out what a coherent policy to get in front of uh, congressional representatives to make this relevant to them as well. And court was absolutely instrumental uh, in the preparation of the materials that will be distributed. 
Uh, one housekeeping issue, uh, there's a Q&A box or chat boxes, this sort of stuff. Um, we will reserve some time at the end for Q&A. Please use the Q&A box. It's the easiest way to communicate rather than trying to follow a chat box uh, at the end of it. So high level about what is inside this bill, right? So again, it's primarily your standard tax bill, right? And what that means is um, they're you know, attempting to lower the threshold for estate taxes or death taxes, as you guys are probably familiar with the term, uh, increase of marginal tax rates at the highest bracket from 37% to closer to 40%. Uh, increased capital gains treatment from 20% to 25% at its highest level, and then a new surtax of 3% uh, on all incomes in excess of $5 million, right? So whether you agree or disagree, you know, uh, elections have consequences, and, and these are the consequences of elections, right? So, so these are the best proposals they can put together. This was kind of uh, called the, the agenda that was proffered uh, throughout the campaign, and what I would say is probably making good on a, on a campaign promise. Right, so so we, we no one should be really be surprised that there's a recommendation to increase taxes generally, and these are all tax measures, and this is what they're attempting to do. But what's very unique in this in this particular bill is you have a lot of unique provisions that are directed at IRAs, and IRAs have generally not been legislated a lot around. So to see um, a, uh, a question around IRAs uh, is is really um, is unique, and so you're probably wondering, like, why on earth did they? Why are they hyper focused? And you have, I think, you know, six or seven of these provisions are IRA specific, uh, and why did they do this? So uh, it says June 2020. It's actually June 2021. So sorry for my typo here, but but um, ProPublica um, uh, issued a very significant article um, identifying in what I call the Peter Thiel story, um, but it's not just about Peter Thiel. Um, the story, if you read it, basically states that. Peter Thiel put his PayPal stock in at a tenth of a penny um, when he was a, uh, a, uh, a owner of the company. He put, a, he put his stock within his Roth IRA, um, and the total value at the time was, was less than $2,000. Um, when PayPal was eventually purchased, it, that accumulated to $26 million in his Roth IRA. He then took his $26 million of earnings in his IRA and he kept investing in other startups and these sorts of things. So he grew this Roth IRA to you know, $5 billion. And so when the ProPublica ran the story, it was basically, you know, look at this super rich guy who exploited our IRA system um, and, um, you know, and then identified several other participants who had also kind of done the same thing, not, not to that scale, but there was other participants who had um, had also gotten up, you know, upwards of hundreds of millions of dollars in their IRA. Um, and, and even some of those participants said, well, we were just following the law, right? So we're not bad actors. This is what the law let us do. So we did it. Um, so obviously that did not jive well, um, particularly with the progressive wing of, of the Democratic Party. And so, so this was very much a lot of the IRA provisions is a reaction to what's happening here of saying we're going to close the loophole. Right, so there's clearly a loophole. We got to close it. It's common sense that we should act on this. And some of these provisions kind of make sense if you if you take that framework uh, in place. So, um, so what does the what do the IR uh, provisions do, and and how do the IR provisions act within this? So these are what I would call the anti Peter Thiel provisions. Um, and so I've got on the slide here kind of the high level of um, of, of who they would affect. Right, so. Uh, they're really aiming at these mega balance accounts, right? These greater than $10 million accounts. They've got income offsetting tests for saying if you make X amount of income uh, per year, then what they're attempting to do is saying is, is the money held in your, if you make, if you have this much in your IRA and you have this sort of income, what we're going to do is we're going to force you to, to withdraw sums early and tax you on those sums, right? So you're Peter Thiel and you're, you have 5 billion. Well, if we can have our way, Peter Thiel, what we're going to do is we're going to make you liquidate you know, 4.99 billion of it get taxed on it today because you're, you know, we're going to basically get back at you for what it's done. But rather than, than the colloquial explanation of it, and Marie, why don't you kind of give a little bit of a, a deeper dive on, on, the, um, on these sections? Yeah, sure, Nima. Um, for those of you that I haven't met on the webinar, my name is Anne Marie Rogers. I'm the sales officer and a certified IRA specialist with Quest Trust Company. So excited to be here today and you know, kind of shedding light on some of the provisions that are part of this legislation. Um, obviously, a huge, huge component is definitely going to affect all of the IRA companies out there. Um, but just to kind of you know shed some light on 
more of the intricacies of the provisions. Um, basically, what they're saying is they're trying to prohibit making further contributions to traditional IRAs, Roth IRAs, and the like, if you have a balance that's higher than 10 million and between a range of about 400 to 450,000, just depending on how you file your taxes, in taxable income as well. On top of that, if you are in that category, let's say you have a $11 million Roth IRA, you're also going to be required to start taking distributions out of that account. And the distributions are pretty steep. So if we use that example, you've got an $11 million IRA, you're a million in excess, you have to take a distribution of 50% of the amount in excess. So a $500,000 distribution and wait, typically when you do this in an IRA, if you're under 59 and a half, which is retirement age, you're gonna have on top of that, a 10% penalty. They're not waiving that. So you're gonna have to take those funds out if you fall into that category. You're not gonna be able to put funds in and you're gonna have to obviously you know, pay taxes and possible penalties. Um, so definitely is, you know, something to be mindful of. I mean, obviously a lot of people, you know, may not fall into that category, um, but I mean, it does affect people. And I think, you know, kind of to the point about Peter Thiel is really they're trying to make very, very specific provisions that are going to affect specifically Roth IRAs. And one thing, I don't know if we'll get into that too much, but one of the huge things, you know, that we're talking about at Quest amongst ourselves and with our clients is kind of the attack that's going on right now for Roths. Um, they're basically eliminating any capacity to do a conversion as well. So for kind of the people that have been on the fence, you know, like, oh, maybe I'll set up a Roth. I don't know, you know, got plenty of time. I'll be grandfathered in one day. Well, that's not the case. So for people that are in this high, you know, earning 400, 450,000, you're not going to be able to do conversions anymore. And no matter your income, even if you only make, you know, 50,000, you know, 60,000, significantly less, you're not going to be able to convert over those pre or sorry, after tax contributions as well. Um, so definitely a lot of IRA related um, negative provisions in this one. And so the, the there are provisions which I call the anti Peter Thiel provisions, and ones that are really directed towards these large accounts. And some of you may be affected, some of you may not. But then there's also what makes this particularly problematic: is there are provisions which prohibit what you can invest in, and that's where this gets very, very uh, uh, sensitive for us. So um, there are two sections which prohibit what you can invest in using your IRA. Uh, and so the first one here is, is section 138314. And we've got kind of three different takes on this issue, which will particularly make it relevant, I think, for the audience here. So Anne-Marie, kind of first, why don't you give us the, the, the background about this particular section? Yeah, so you know, as it stands today, before any of this would go through, when you're investing with a retirement account, there are some restrictions that you have to follow. As the account holder, you're what's considered a disqualified person. And disqualified persons also include pretty much your immediate family members. And there's certain things that you can't do with you know, your IRA account. One of the things that they're trying to change is you would not be able to invest into a company in which you had more than a 10% stake in. And what's interesting is it's also going to apply not only for yourself, but again, it does go back and apply to those disqualified persons. So perhaps you have a spouse or a parent that perhaps has a percentage of ownership that would be factored into that 10% as well. Um, so, you know, for those of you that might have a checkbook control IRA, definitely it's going to affect that. You wouldn't be able to do that moving forward. Um, and of course would have to, you know, potentially consider your options because you're going to have a two-year time frame of getting that out of the account. I mean, Kevin as well, kind of, you know, landing this, uh, I know mortgage fund managers in particular can be hit yeah. really here. So why don't you give us the background of what the previous rules were and, and what they're likely kind of targeting here. Right. So Hi guys, Kevin here. Uh, I'm Nima's partner. I manage our securities division. We represent a lot of debt funds and real estate funds. And as you all know, one of the, the one of the fundamental tenets in dealing with IRAs in a fund is the what we call a 25% rule, right? IRC 4975. This code section installs a lot of the, like it basically says that the fund becomes the equivalent of an IRA 
once it reaches 25% of IRA money in the fund. This particular code section would essentially torpedo that rule and extend the prohibited transactions and disqualified persons rule to you know, a fund essentially at a much lower threshold. And what's interesting about this is that you know, all the rules, all the same analyses that Emory just mentioned will apply. So the lineal uh, no, ancestor and descendant rules apply. And so one of the things that we tell clients is, you know, if you've got a fund and, and you want to be in your own fund as an investor, as an LP or a member, and you want to use your IRA, right? One of the things that we talk about is, you know, once that 25% rule kicks in, it's a no-no, but until then it's okay. And so that, that changes the name of the game, right? Because you, you have to watch out for that constantly because this is, this is going to be now a prohibition altogether almost. Um, but it also, not only that, but it also applies to you, your, your spouse or your, your domestic partner, and then up and down the family tree, right? So children, grandchildren, parents, grandparents. So that's, that's a pretty broad prohibition when it comes to funds, when especially in the first year or two of capital raising, they're focusing on friends and family. So it can definitely, this is definitely, you know, a, a, a very bad thing uh, for any kind of, uh, you know, uh, Reg D, debt fund, real estate fund, or any kind of startup, really, that's raising money from IRS. And, you know, just to kind of expand on what Kevin is saying, you know, obviously these prohibited transaction types of rules, these are already in existence. If you get caught doing it, right, this is a no-no, there's going to be potential penalties for your IRA. Um, but really, there's specific language in there that's changing it from being just a prohibited transaction to actually being an IRA specific rule that you will not be able to do this, which is interesting. And then court, I know this directly affects you as well. I mean, you know, you can really kind of take this home in terms of, of why do we care whether a mortgage fund manager can invest their own funds? Yeah, thanks, Neem. There's, a, there's about two or three different angles here for a company like ours, Nexus Private Capital. We are a fund. We invest um, our, our investor capital in private loans. Uh, in our case, about 22% of our investors are IRA or pension, or IRA or, or uh, investment, you know, profit sharing plans. So that's a significant chunk. We have over $50 million in assets. We're, we're small fry in the grand scheme of things, but there's a lot of companies like us. So if we've got 22% of our investors with IRA holdings, my guess is there's a lot of other folks with a large percentage of IRA holdings in their funds and investments as well. Uh, for me personally, I invest in the fund as a small business owner. All of our investors want to know that I personally have skin in the game. Uh, I have skin in the game uh, in part in an IRA investment. And so with this legislation, frankly, uh, I would not be able to have my IRA investment in the fund, and therefore I would have less or perhaps in some cases, no skin in the game but for our investors. And that's a problem. They're not going to invest if I'm not investing. Uh, I think as a third point, it's a very big point, less about the, our industry specifically and more about small businesses across the country. By far, the vast majority of all new business formation employment is in small businesses. There are about 45,000 offerings in small business offerings in any given year. I'm talking about raising money versus about 2,000 or so um, public offerings. Uh, and in total dollars raised, by and more money is raised for businesses each year in Reg D offerings than through any other form. So if you think about it, Small businesses are the lifeblood of our economy. It generates more job, more capital raise, more investment. And yet we're attacking it with this legislation. We're saying, hold on, let's cut off the lifeblood of capital to small businesses across the country with this IRA game. It's, it's unbelievable. So that's why uh, we think it's an emergency, this emergency meeting is worth having. And so and the really interesting thing, too, because you'll see this in the next provision, which is really the center point of our conversation here, is there's the, what is probably most troubling uh, about how the legislation is currently written is it not only prohibits future investment, right? So starting on January 1 of next year, you would be prohibited for this, from this sort of investment. But what's really crazy is there is a mandatory divestment period. If you are holding this investment, you have two years to exit the position or you'll have to be, pay taxes on the entire amount. You lose your IRA protection uh, on it. And so it's, it's actually got a mandatory divestment, both from this, so Court is using his, him as the example here, is he would have to divest from his own mortgage fund. Uh, he'd have two years to do it, right? Regardless of impact, regardless of what, what his offering documents state, it doesn't care about what the contractual agreements are between him and his investors. 
is he would have a mandatory divestment in his own company uh, should this happen. And that takes us on to the next slide here, which is, and we've talked about it a little bit or kind of alluded to it, which is in addition to investing in your own company, you are prohibited from investing in any private offering, which has a minimum level of assets or income as a requirement. As many of you know, all Reg D offerings would qualify as this, right? You are what is known as an accredited investor, right? You have to have $1 million of net worth, exclusive of your home, furnishings, right? You guys know the, you know the, the, the tagline, right? Um, or $400,000 of adjusted gross income, right? So, so we all know this. Um, and, and in fact, that's how many mortgage funds um, have capitalized there. And, and some have, have taken it, you know, Kevin talked about the 25% rule earlier a little bit, but a lot of them have taken this to, you know, a, a new level and they have, you know, close to hundred percent ownership or have set up entirely IRA based funds to help capitalize on, right? Um, as you know, the, the income being generated off these things is ordinary income typically, right? And so it's, it's very tax advantageous to have it into an IRA or other tax deferred uh, account um, because of the treatment of, of, of how these investments are typically treated. So um, this is the, the most significant impact is, is any investment which that is non-public in nature, which has some sort of income test. And there's other tests too. So for example, if it requires you to have special licensing to make the investment, but for our space, it's probably going to be the accredited investor issues that are going to cause us the most heartburn. Um, exact same issues being identified here, which is Future, bars future investment, right? Can no longer invest in, in any of these private Reg D funds. And similarly, if you have investors who are investing in your fund, they have two years to exit the investment, regardless of what the PPM says, regardless of what discretion you have as a fund manager. You know, it, there's there's no carve out for that. It's they are forced to divest or they pay the tax consequences on it. So, um, and, and that's just the mortgage lending side of this, right? That's assuming that the investment is going to be on the debt side and you're invest, you know, for example, into courts fund. But it's also, if you think about it, a lot of real estate syndications also use Reg D, right? And so how many apartment low, you know, how many apartment purchases and things like that all are gonna have the same issue. And they're 10 times more liquid than, than the real estate investments, right? I mean, you know, court may have some ability to, to manage this over a two-year process. You're in an apartment loan, like literally what do you do? Do you just sell the apartment? And then how else do, I di do you divest, right? How do you get your money out of this thing? Um, and so it's, it's just a massive system-wide shock. And so, you know, we'll be seeing this tagline going out, but this is really a save Reg D issue, right? I mean, Reg D really relies upon IRA investment as a bedrock for the sort of investment. And some of you have already identified in this chat, but here's what the craziest part, if you really think about it, is where's the money, right? This is a tax bill. This is supposed to create revenue. There's nothing in here that actually produces taxes. All it does is says, go take your money out of court's fund and go put it into the stock market. This doesn't have the accreditation standard. That's literally all that happens. There is it stays in a deferred account, stays deferred until you retire, never changes it. There is no tax consequence of any of this. And so it truly is. And, and the only rationale I have heard in terms of understanding why is this that in here is that there is a, um, that, private investments tend to yield higher yield results. And so what they think is that your average consumer can only invest in the stock market. They're not, they, they don't have access to, to uh, reg the offering because they're not an accredited investor, right? And so what the, the theory here is it levels the investment playing field, which is nuts. I mean, truly, if there was ever a, a garbage policy going into this thing, this is it, right? Which is is let's take private investment, the one thing that truly capitalizes most small businesses, and let's gut it. That's a great way to create economic uh, activity in our country. I mean, it, it's, again, insanity at its, at its highest and best, uh, if that's the thought process going into this, because it truly will take from, from Main Street, all Reg D investments is effectively small investments into, uh, into uh, local projects, and truly go, take it all out, go invest, in, go invest in the stock market or bond market. That's what your choice is now, right? So, you know, because that's what needs to happen here is, is banks absolutely need more resources. So what, what is happening? You know, in the background of this, what are we seeing? What is the, the result of this? Um, first is, as probably many of you know, there is infighting between the democratic progressive wing and the moderate wing, um, particularly with senators uh, Mansion and Cinema. The Mansion is out of West Virginia, and Cinema is out of Arizona. Um, and uh, Cinema has been very tightly lipped; has said very little. 
uh, about why she opposes the three and a half trillion dollar bill. Uh, Manchin has stated top line doesn't like the size. He's recommended a size of reducing the three and a half trillion dollar bill down to something closer to 1.5 trillion. So these are the public statements that are being made related to um, the bill. Um, where that shakes out, we'll find out. Biden recently announced um, that he believes some compromise between one and a half trillion to two trillion is probably the right size of the bill to get both, um, uh, si uh, both wings aligned. But he's also set a bit of urgency to it saying, I expect this to be resolved by the end of this month. Whether it can, whether it can't, we'll find out. But there is urgency to the matter is not something that we can really sit back on passively. Um, and more importantly, in what is probably the scarier issue of that is it doesn't really matter the size of the bill. Because remember, the last two things, the things that we really care about, don't create revenue, right? So from their perspective, they don't ever have to consider whether they care, wh whether that provision stays in, stays out, revenue neutral, right? So ultimately, is that's a policy decision that is not wise and has no real concept in the background of, of, of whether we should do it. And that is really what the mobilization effort is on, is getting people to understand what is a Reg D investment, why it matters, who it funds, right? And that you're effectively removing choices from investors and truly harming the people you intend on helping the most, which is the small business versus the mega corporation. So what are we doing, right? What is the actual action plan? You know, hopefully this has been informative and you now know why this thing matters to you, uh, which is great, um, but now we got to do something about it, right? So um, you've probably seen companies such as Quest out there. Many of them have uh, on their websites have letters you can complete and these sorts of things about how you can get activated. We're trying to bring this to the mortgage lending industry as a whole. And we'll talk more about that. Um, but for private mortgage lenders, it, we're trying to make this an acute issue for us, right? Rather than just IRA investors specifically. So one is we've drafted an official policy pr um, position paper, which outlines what is Reg D, how is Reg D used in the mortgage industry, both to purchase real estate assets as well as to invest in real estate loans? Um, and so we have a we have a corollary position paper that is written, or really a sample letter that is from the mortgage company's position, right? So you're a court, you can be in a you can be an employee of a mortgage fund, or really any company that is being affected by this. You, how this affects your company and your industry from that vantage point. Candidly, your congressional people probably don't care. Um, they didn't care about you before this, they probably don't care about you after this. That's not the position and that's gonna move the needle. We've separately created another corollary letter that is from the IRA investor standpoint. That is, you are, I'm an IRA investor, I'm stashing away my hard earned dollars in retirement accounts and you're robbing me of my choice. Those are the letters and those are the people that will actually have impact here. All of this is gonna be distributed by email. There is a web link. Uh, if you guys look at the chat, Kat has put it in there. Um, it's active, it's online now. So there's a web link where you can access these. In addition to the letters being available to you, there is also a, how do I contact, who are my representatives? So if you punch in your address there, it will tell you, here's your, here's your House of Representatives representative, here's your Senator representative. And so you can send letters to those people directly. It's a pre-filled letter. You can customize it. You can modify it. You can tell your compelling story. The key in this is dispelling the myth, right? So uh, there's two myths here. One is, or I don't know if we call myths, even, but one is identifying that these are small businesses you are funding and you are taking that money and you are paying it to large corporations. That is the wealth transfer that's truly occurring here by doing this. And the second one is that the people who are being affected are not Peter Thiel. I mean, sure, it sucks to be him after this thing passes, but it's actually people, every single person who has an IRA who has chosen to invest their IRA wisely, right? That's who's truly being affected. And so you've done a, a cannonball response to what required a scalpel if you actually wanted to deal with people abusing their IRAs, right? So all of this is gonna be available and distributed after this call here. So what are you, like you're, on, you're here on this call, like what can you do? What are your next steps? We've talked about this. The investors, the, the IRA investors that you work with, so whether that's you syndicating debt, so you're pulling one or more IRA investors as the lender in your loan transaction, whether you're investing into a mortgage fund or, or you work with people who are investing in your mortgage fund, these are the people that will move the conversation. The facts are the facts. 98% of IRAs have less than a million dollar balance, 98% of them, right? We don't know the statistic on the $10 million plus, probably not that significant, right? 80% of IRA accounts have less than $300,000 in them. So these are the people you're affecting. You're affecting the 98% and limiting their choice in investment. And that's the message that has to be communicated out there. So what can you do is contact 
any, uh, all of the people that you work with that are using their IRAs to invest in, in your businesses, whether through debt or equity, and getting in front of them and letting them know this is a real thing, pointing them to AAPL's website where they can download the letter, simply fill in the name of the, the person they're contacting and send it off, right? It's as easy as that. We've tried to take out all the friction in the process. What are we going to do as an association and what is our plan to mobilize here? So we've talked about this, which is we're really targeting mortgage fund managers. They're the ones that will have the heaviest impact. If many, if not most mortgage funds utilize IRA investors. So this is the one, particularly on the divestment problem. You know, if you don't act here, you've got a, a real significant possibility that, that your investors have to liquidate their positions within your, your mortgage fund if this thing passes. We are hyper-focused on the state of Arizona as we should be. Why? Because that's where Senator Sinema is, right? If we want to have actual impact here, it's getting an audience with her is truly going to make the biggest impact because I doubt anyone in Congress, let alone Senator Sinema, has any idea what these things do, right? So, so getting this content to her is vitally important. Uh, we've been talking to some of the members. We have APL's many members out there uh, in Arizona. I saw um, our dear friends, uh, Alan Marsh as well on this, on this thing. I'm very glad you're here as well. I uh, will definitely be pinging you because if you're in Arizona and you have any political connection or affiliation, we really want to lean on you. But we've been ta in talks with Noah Brocious at Capital Fund One, Chris Hansen at Hansen Capital, and our intent is to mobilize extensively within the state of Arizona. We're also working with other associations. Um, this is one of those things where we have strength in numbers only, right? Uh, you could hire the best lobbyists in the country. They ain't going to matter right now, right? It is how many letters, how many phone calls do they receive? will actually determine whether this thing has any ability to be acted upon. So strength in numbers will be everything. So uh, recently we've been in talks with California Mortgage Association uh, and their general counsel. Uh, they're bought in and ready to move forward as well and mobilize their base. We're also in talks with Arizona Private Lender Association. But again, we're happy to work with every association out there. Our goal is to get this message out, to work extensively and to act swiftly because time is not on our side. That's all, folks. So we'll go ahead and go to the, some of the questions that are sitting in the chat and the Q&A box. Friendly reminder, after this, we will be delivering the slides that came through here, the position paper, as well as links to contact um, your uh, congressional representatives, um, either as a mortgage fund manager or alternatively uh, as to, to offer to your IRA investors or for yourself if you also use your IRA uh, to invest. So um, hopping over to the Q&A first. Um, you know, there's a question about whether this is even, you know, legally uh, applicable, right? Can you, effectively, is, is you have a divestment period, you have lots of laws that go in um, and, and affect people uh, that, that require a divestment and these sorts of things may be legally dubious. Uh, hopefully, we will never find the answer to that question. Um, and hopefully, we can just get some clarity and get these provisions ripped out altogether. Uh, next question here is, will I still be able to use my Roth IRA to be a lender? I like to lend funds to investors, to real estate deals. We don't know, right? Ultimately, the question is, is as the summaries are written, we don't know what sort of investments you will be able to make in your IRA. What are they, is that considered something that required any sort of, of um, income accreditation uh, or asset accreditation? Uh, and, and that's the gray box here, right? So, so we know with clarity, can't invest into a reg D, right? We have absolute certainty on that issue. But let's say, for example, you're in California, you're a real estate broker, and you like to syndicate deals on the debt side. We don't know whether we don't know whether your 10% net worth requirement on those deals uh, and your limitations on amount of investment are going to cause heartburn. There's, there's just no clarity in the law as written to determine that. And until we do get clarity, um, you know, I would suspect that that the intent of the current bill is to prohibit you from private investment, such as what you just described here. And I'll chime in there, guys. For 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 most of you who are asking about you know, doing multi-beneficiary, multi-lender transactions, you're going to have to look at the exemption that you're relying upon, right? So Reg D is one of many, right? There's the California exemption. There's a, a slew of them from a whole loan investor standpoint as well. So if you're a lender versus a whole loan investor, the analysis that has to be had is we have to look at the, the exemption in which you're relying upon and evaluate, does that exemption have this essential, essentially accreditation standard that Congress is trying to attach as a prohibition. In most contexts for a whole loan investment in most states and at the federal level, you're not going to see that type of accreditation requirement. So it's unlikely, but 
you know, in some in some frameworks, there's a prohibition on the amount you can invest tied to your net worth, like in California. So that may apply. And so, you know, it's it's a very it's too early to tell. But uh, for the whole loan investors out there, this is going to be a little uh, unlikely to impact you as much. But for the fractional loan investors, it definitely could. Yeah. And one question I've been getting a lot, and I'd like to get Anne Marie's thoughts on is is the differentiation. So for example, there's lots of questions about 401ks, defined benefit plans, these sorts of things. Do you have any color right now in terms of, of the effect on these sorts of plans versus just the, the IRAs, which are black and white? Yeah, you know, I think someone put in the Q&A section, you know, is this kind of a sign of things to come? And, you know, I think should this go through, you know, certainly, but right now, you know, we're really specifically talking about the focal point being IRAs um, rather than solo 401ks. But I mean, certainly they're gathering information. They have been for a while. So, you know, do with that what you will. Right. And I remember reading some provision that they, they put, um, uh, I think it wasn't either the defined benefit plans or another plan was clearly written in there or, you know, the, the, so it's definitely, I, I didn't see anything about 401ks, but, but uh, it appears that there is, there is some collateral damage outside of just IRAs that are going to be involved here. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and another kind of call it a comment versus a question more so, but I agree. And this is probably a pivotal discussion point to the degree that you can actually get in touch with the representatives is, is that Reg D is not a particularly partisan issue, right? It tends to be a pretty universally supported um, the Jobs Act was was bipartisan. The Jobs Act 2.0 was bipartisan, uh, and it created massive economic impacts uh, for the betterment of society. So this is not a partisan issue, and we've intentionally stayed out of the partisan politics. Like I said, I, whether you agree or disagree on the tax side of it, vote differently next time. Right, and that, that's your choice there. But as it pertains to this sort of stuff here, um, this shouldn't be in the bill. It is just incoherent in terms of it doesn't actually. If it's a democratically proposed bill, the last thing I think that they want to do is effectively what they're about to do, which is require the divestment from small businesses and put them into large businesses. That's all that actually happens here. And that's one of the clarifying things that needs to occur is to explain that in a coherent way that a person in Congress will understand. And I have stress, guys, Reg D, you know, Congress put out a report on this issue. They're aware of this. They put out a report when they were harmonizing the, the regs and back you know, last year and their records, their report says from 2009 to 2019, Reg D was responsible for $15 trillion in capital being raised. $15 trillion, that's a T, right? And private funds like ours, the ones we work with, represented $11.5 trillion of that. It's a large sum of money that they cannot be ignored, and they're essentially trying to cut out a good chunk of it. All right. Um, we've already answered the question about whole notes. Next one on here is, so this is an interesting question, you know, basically what, you know, we've already talked a little bit about, um, connecting. Unfortunately, we have one of these issues where there actually is a, you know, normally and we've already had discussions with national mortgage bankers association and other national, um, advocacy groups. The problem you actually have is, is their positions probably not ours. Right. If you actually think about this and pierce this back on a national platform, this is great if you're a national mortgage banker. It requires divestment from court and an investment to Bank of America. So they're probably not too disappointed about the current statute as written. Um, and that's probably the national position of most mortgage bankers associations. This really is an issue of private lenders. And that's why we're, you know, we, we're not trying to be a boy who cried wolf here. We, we're throwing an emergency meeting not because we didn't have anything to do. <laughs> We're doing this because our industry is about to get a hammer brought to it that uh, is that appears to be an unintended consequence. So, you know, what really is helpful are, uh, and intentionally why we're connecting with California Mortgage Association, which is a private lender organization. APLA is typically a private lender organization. So we're really focusing our effort on, on those who are, are most connected on this one. Uh, we're reaching out to other associations for that. For example, California Mortgage Bankers Association, they also represent a lot of debt funds. So, so there's other associations that we'll be connecting with over time uh, to try to get this message out there. Um, but it is acute to our industry because our industry revolves around Reg D versus your typical mortgage industries, which are either indifferent about Reg D uh, or actually probably prefer that Reg D didn't exist in the first place for the purposes of their business. Uh, the only thing that, that actually may be helpful is for those of you that are connected to your association of realtors is is you have an actual syndication problem too, right? That's the other ancillary to that. We're talking about the, the what's happening at the mortgage lender level. Obviously it's the, the constituency we represent, but if you are in the apartment building business 
this is going to devastate you, or if you're going to be, you know, purchasing it or using real estate syndications at all, most are reg D. And so this is also going to cause a huge issue on the equity side as well. And so it could also very much hamper, you know, the Walker and Dunlops and those of the world that, that really need equity to get formed in order to get the investment going as well. So, so upstream and downstream effects uh, for our industry. Um, one of the questions was, was Senator, Senator Sinema's position as well as Senator Kelly. Um, the only thing that we are aware of is that Senator Sinema has, has voiced opposition in general to the size of the bill um, and has not made much commentary. I, I doubt that Senator Sinema uh, or Senator Kelly have any knowledge whatsoever about, and actually, let me take that statement one step forward. I doubt anyone in Congress has any idea what, what we just talked about. This is completely going to be off their radar. So this is why we went to the extent that we did to write educational content uh, on this issue, because you will have to educate them. You'll have to explain to them what Reg D is, because they're not going to understand the relevance and the importance of this. Uh, they may high level understand it, but they're not going to understand the granular issue that IRA investors choose to invest in Reg D investments, particularly ones that, that, that produce interest income, right? Like that, that's a, a bunch of logical leaps you're going to have to walk them through um, for them to understand the relevancy and why they should care. Uh, is it safe to say that if the bill passes, that it'll, it'll eliminate all options for alternative asset investing uh, for traditional and Roth IRA holders? Yeah, I mean, that's, that, again, we're, as an industry, we're hyper-focused on obviously the mortgage lending consequence. You're investing in Reg D. I don't know, it could be crypto at this point. Whatever, insert Reg D investment, right? This is a prohibition on any investment which has an accreditation standard. So if you're using a 506C or a 506B, there's an accreditation standard to invest in that offering. Um, it would prohibit you from any investment. That includes any that includes local exemptions as well, folks. So if you're thinking like you, we're going to use local exemptions or we're going to use Reg A or we're going to, a lot of these still discuss the standard of an accredited investor as part of the framework. And so, you know, it definitely has to be, we have to wait for the final rule, but Reg D is definitely a risk here. Um, and and will succeed in particular, um, but regulation A and Bible 6B are also at risk because the way they're written um, concentrates around the concept of an accredited investor is not dependent upon it, but it's still highly connected to it. So uh, I, I venture a guess that it's going to put that at risk as well. And, and next, and Anne-Marie, I see you typing already, so it's perfect, which was uh, the profit sharing plans. Similarly, I don't know if you have any, any news on, on profit sharing plans, whether those are in or outside the bill currently. No, no, I don't really have anything on that. I mean, just to say that, you know, the $10 million threshold that they're talking about is, um, you know, an aggregate. It's not just one account. It's all of them, including, you know, uh, defined contribution plan, that sort of thing. Right. Um, who is responsible for inserting them? I don't know. We actually don't know the source of the insertion. We know the cause, right? We know, we, we know this is what we call the anti Peter Thiel effect. So we know what, we know what's driving their motivations. And that's why we think we have a winnable issue anyways, which is, you know, look, we can try to fight the $10 million issues, probably worthy of, of making a mention, but that's not what the hill we die on, right? Um, that is what this bill was designed to address, which is they have an ax to grind with extremely wealthy individuals who have, who have lots of money inside their IRAs. There's an ax to grind with them. Um, and, you know, and it's unfortunate that it is what it is. But these provisions, and, th and that will actually produce Pretty significant taxable income, right? So if you have more than $10 million, you know, the, if the law passed as it stands today, it would require mandatory distributions of half of it each year of half of anything above $10 million, right? Assuming you have gross income in excess of 450. So there will be real consequence and tax consequence for those sorts of decisions, right? So agree or disagree, I don't know, right? But but the, the ones that have no tax consequence shouldn't be in there. That, that's what makes no sense. There is no tax consequence. This is simply... Uh, a probably what I would say is a well-meaning provision uh, in terms of creating uh, equality and in investments between people who are accredited investors and not accredited investors. Uh, but play it out for a second and it gets, you know, it shows you that it wasn't well thought out. Uh, somebody had asked about Reg A and Kevin had answered that as well as is Reg A would be affected as well beyond Reg D. Well, I want to be very clear. It's possible, right? right. The, the, the nice part about Reg A Tier 2, I'm not even talking about Tier 1, uh, is that it does have a broad framework and that allows to raise capital from the public, but they, they have allocations essentially per class. And so 
you know, Reg A, 144, you know, there's a lot of different exemptions out there and this could impact all of them because all of them have some type of uh, uh, investor eligibility standard. Uh, and, and another question for you as well here, Anne-Marie, which is the, the question is, isn't self-dealing already prohibited um, can you, uh, aren't you prohibited from investing in your own fund as it stands today? Yeah, you know, I think that's what Kevin and I were kind of trying to go into earlier is, you know, obviously there are some restrictions as a disqualified person, um, but typically, you know, the threshold's about 50%. So basically it's now being reduced down to the 10%. Um, and again, you know, that does extend out not just for you, um, but also for, you know, personal uh, spouse, parents, children, as Kevin mentioned as well. Right, guys, the, 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 what I was talking about earlier is if you're a fund manager, not an IRA investor, right? If you're a fund manager, the rules say that once you hit 25% of IRA money in your fund on the equity side, LPs are membership, right? Then the entire fund is treated as an IRA or the equivalent thereof. And so we have there's a prohibition on self-dealing. That's a different rule, right? As opposed to when you're looking at an IRA owner himself and his account. Uh, next question here is, is there a 25% IRA rule with a Reg A plus offering? Uh, kick yes. it over to Oh, Kevin, there you go. <laughs> yes, very much so. Any offering that require on, on the equity side. Uh, guys, if I can, I just want to emphasize a, what I think is a very important point here. Um, there are about 30 to 40,000 private placements in the United States in any given year. That compares with maybe 200 uh, public offerings. So 30 to 40,000 private placements, maybe a couple of hundred public offerings. In 2019, for example, about uh, 1.2 trillion was raised through, pri through private placements. Uh, that is more than was raised in public offerings. The average size in terms of headcount, number of investors in those private placements was 10, 10 investors, as opposed to thousands of people participating in any given public offering. So Reg D offerings really benefit who? It's small businesses, okay? By far, lots of them, 40,000, 30,000 versus 200. Uh, as a fund manager, we're concerned about the IRA impact but you know what? A lot of the people we lend money to are LLCs. LLCs capitalize through private placements with two and three and four employees and 10 investors. And an average in these 2019 numbers, for example, of only 2.25 million per offering. This is a small business owner's nightmare. This legislation, I don't think these legislators have any idea that they are striking literally at the heart of small business in, in the United States. So while we're focused on the IRA component of this, as I said, we're about 22% of our investors are IRA investors. We are literally, these legislative members are literally striking at the heart and soul of the jobs generator in this country. I don't think they have a clue. If they did, they would never do this. And so it's really, really important. Anybody who's on the line, get on, hit the link right now, today, tonight, get your friends to hit the link and send a letter, make a phone call. We have to really let these people know that they are making a huge mistake. It's not about the Peter Thiel's of the world. It's about the everyday mom and pop people with pickup trucks, flipping a house and rehabbing a building. Thank you. Thank you, Corey. Um, uh, Kevin, questions on 506B specifically keep kind of popping up. So Yeah. So when, when I first got this notice a few weeks ago, I was like, well, there's an angle here that B might work, right? 506B, the rule says that you can have 35 non-accredited investors and you can have you know, um, as many accredited investors as you'd like and everyone self-verifies their accredited status. So there's the eligibility requirement. So if you were a non-accredited investor, could you utilize your IRA to invest? At this point in time, I'd venture a guess, yes, but there's no way to know until we actually get the code because that. The way this thing works is the, the, the current you know, write-up that we received is a summary. And this part is like one paragraph right now. That one paragraph is going to be five pages once they're done with it. So that's going to, we're going to have to really parse it. Uh, my guess is that you know, it's, a, it's a possibility, but you know, the vast majority of our, our clientele now 
use 506C as in Charlie, which is a strict verified accredited investors only standard. And so and that's the vast majority, I would say probably 85 to 90% of the funds that we create. And so that's a, this is a big problem, right? And, and many, many clients have told me that their IRA investors have, have perked up because of volatility on Wall Street. This is essentially going to, you know, going to kneecap a lot of my clients. And this is a terrible idea for all of, all of uh, uh, I, guess, I guess, small business in America, as Court said it. Kevin, in August 2020, the SEC delivered a report to Congress that was requested by, I forget which, which budget or whichever committee. And that report from the SEC to Congress identified that 93 to 97% of all Reg D offerings include at least one accredited investor. Right. Right. All right. Um... If these, are, if these new regs and IRAs come into law, would a possible solution be to change your funds registration to eliminate the accredited investor requirement, right? So is, is there an alternative vehicle? Yeah. So right now we're, we're postulating that Regulation A Tier 2 is going to be our, our go-to option because the solution on Regulation A, the, the, the standards there are not strictly requiring that eligibility to invest. And so it is the most likely or some other similar type, you know, public type offerings or smaller tier offerings like a 504 or a Reg CF, but those aren't really useful in our space. And so uh, there's that. There's also some, some thought that we've had in discussions with clients who manage larger funds is, um, is there a solution where you can transition the account into a similar strategy? But I, that I would defer to Anne-Marie on that because really what it is, is you know, essentially the targeting IRAs, is there a similar type of, uh, of, of account that I can switch to that'll give me a temporary Band-Aid while while I'm being prohibited to go with my IRA, so. Uh, next question on here is, and we briefly touched upon it, but but why why this provision? Right? Why are they? Why do they want a prohibition on private investments? Uh, the best um, um, explanation I've heard thus far is that a credit they don't want accredited investors to have unique investment opportunities, and so because they know that these investments yield typically higher returns than a public investment, they're worried that this is increasing the wealth gap, that the accredited investors will only get richer um, because they have access to accredited investment offerings that are not available to your Main Street purchases. And so it's really an equality issue and a wealth gap issue. Um, but again, the parties being, which true, maybe, you know, might be true, might be not, might not be true, but, but ultimately the parties being harmed or the small businesses they are investing in, um, they're the ones that really face the impact of this. Um, and it's, I think it's speculative to say um, that all private investments, you know, while they may produce higher returns, they definitely produce higher uh, risk oftentimes. And so there's a, a risk reward that's coming with this. It's not just some abstract rich people get special investments that they can invest in. Uh, next question was related to why are we not uh, lobbying California as well? We are. We actually are in talks with California Mortgage Association. California Mortgage Association has uh, multiple registered lobbyists. And so um, this will be actually very directly affecting California, and, and you know we're we're, uh, we're we're not leaving our good friends in California alone uh, on this issue as well. Um, quite an interesting question for Kevin, and the last one here, which is, what happens if a sponsor cannot redeem all of his IRA clients? So yeah, and this is actually the biggest concern on my end, right? Because a lot of these funds have a strict prohibition internally in, installed in their operating agreements or LP agreements that, you know, prohibit a mass exodus. And you typically have, you know, some discretionary authority by the fund manager, but, you know, you've got a contractual issue here um, and a fiduciary duty issue here that's competing with legis tax legislation, not to mention the fiscal and financial impacts on the fund. Um, and so, you know, I, I would venture a guess that on the legislation side, you're probably going to have a pretty big penalty if you can't do it. And I, I defer to Anne-Marie on that. From a contractual side and from a fund document side, you know, from a fund management side, yeah, this is a problem because, you know, you essentially will have to kneecap your fund in doing so and possibly violate the terms of your operating agreement or LP agreement. Anne-Marie, any thoughts on like, you know, the potential penalties if they wouldn't, how this, would, how this might play out? 
No, I mean, I think that you answered it well. I think we're, you know, kind of like everyone else, we're trying to stay abreast of everything, but kind of wondering ourselves exactly what the, you know, effects will be. Right. And, that, and that's what, a point, like how poorly written this summer, even the summary was, you can't do something, but we don't know what the penalty is going to be if you do it. So it's, it's very well thought out. Right. Well, again, thank you, uh, everyone, for being on the call today. Um, and again, you'll be getting a follow-up email um, we already have a campaign that is online, so it's uh, AAPL's website, which is aaplonline.com forward slash save reg D. It's been in the chat thread, so if you want to hit your little chat button, uh, you will see it there and you'll see it kind of replayed. But again, you'll get that email to you shortly here. If you click on that link, it will take you to these pre-filled letters. So again, just utilize the resources. We've built them out for you. Uh, you can leave them unmodified if you want to. You can modify them and tie them to your story. The more you can communicate that you're just simply part of that 98%, right? That you're just an average, average IRA holder who has spent time and energy investing wisely as you've been told to do. Um, that's the message that needs to be resonated, right? This is a restriction of choice on investment at the end of the day. That's what makes this problematic. And so the more we can get that message communicated clearly, um, the better we will do here. So uh, please feel free to share this video, the content, the slides. We will be uh, clearly promoting this more and more in the weeks ahead of us. You know, obviously, this will not be the last time you see our shining faces um, uh, anytime until we get final clarity on this issue. Uh, we think we've got a real shot at this one, um, and primarily because it is not a revenue-producing measure, right? It's probably one in which you just have a well-meaning legislator who doesn't actually understand the impact, and that's ripe for advocacy. Because if you can get that, if you can plant the bug in the ear about, hey, look, this doesn't have the consequences you're looking for, uh, then you can get some meaningful changes. We might not, you know, I, I wouldn't be a, a betting man on the 39.6% tax rate. I feel like that's going where it's going to go. But, you know, uh, I don't know what the over-under is on, on 312. I think we got to get a shot at this one. All right, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you, APL. Thank you, Linda and Kat, for hosting this with us. Thank you for Kevin, Court, and Anne-Marie. I uh, really, really appreciate your time today and uh, see you guys uh, on the internet shortly here. Appreciate it. Good job, Nima. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.